will be to implant in their presence a new organ, an organ-like Kundabuffer, but this time having such crop. 30 said every one of these unfortunates, during the process of his existence, should constantly sense and be aware of the inevitability of his own death, as well as of the death of everyone upon whom his eyes, or attention, rest. Only such a sensation and such an awareness could destroy the egoism now so completely crystallized in them that it has swallowed up the whole of their essence, and at the same time uproot the tendency to hate others which flows from it, the tendency that engenders those mutual relationships which are the chief cause of all their abnormalities, unbecoming to three brain beings and maleficent for them and for the whole of the universe. Quote. Chapter 48 From the Author After six years of work, merciless toward myself and with almost continuous tense mentation, yesterday I at last finished putting down on paper in a form. I think, accessible to everybody the first of the three series of books I intended to write, and in which I had decided to develop a whole body of ideas, which would permit me to accomplish, first in theory and then in practice, by means I had previously thought out, three essential tasks I had set myself by means of the first series, to destroy in people everything that in their false representations appears to exist in reality or, in other words, to sweep away without mercy, all the rubbish accumulated in human mentation over the ages, by means of the second series, to prepare, new constructional material, and by means of the third, to build a new world. Having now finished the first series of books, and following the practice, established on earth long ago, of never concluding any such, great undertaking, without what some call an epilogue, others and afterward, still others, from the author, and so on, I also now propose to write something of the kind. With this in view, I read over very attentively this morning the preface I wrote six years ago, entitled, The Arousing of Thought, in order to take suitable ideas from it for what might be called a corresponding, logical fusion, of that beginning with this conclusion I am now about to write. While reading that first chapter, which I wrote only six years ago, but which gave me the sensation of having been written long, long ago, a sensation that is now in my common presence undoubtedly because during those years I had. To think intensely, and even, as might be said, to experience all the material required for eight thick volumes, as not for nothing is it stated in that branch of genuine science called the laws of association of human mentation, which has come down from very ancient times and is known to only a few contemporary people that, the sensation of the flow of time is directly proportional to the quality and quantity of the flow of thoughts. Well then, while I was reading that first chapter, which, as I said, I had thought about deeply from every aspect and, experienced, almost exclusively under the action of my voluntary self-mortification, and which, moreover, I had written at a time when the functioning of my entire whole, a functioning that engenders in a man what is called the power to manifest himself by his own initiative, was utterly disharmonized, that is, 
When I was still extremely ill from the effects of an accident that had occurred to me not long before, consisting in a charge and crash of my automobile at full speed into a tree standing silently, like an observer and reckoner of the disorderly passage of centuries, on the historic road between the world capital of Paris and the town of Fontainebleau, a charge which, according to any sane human understanding, should have put an end to my life. Well then, from reading that chapter there arose in me a quite definite decision. Recalling my state during the writing of that first chapter, I cannot help adding here, owing to a small weakness of mine that always causes me to experience an inner satisfaction whenever I see on the faces of our estimable contemporary, representatives of exact science, that very specific smile, peculiar to them alone, that although, after this accident, my body was so battered and, everything in it so disordered, that for months it presented a general picture which might be described as, a piece of live meat in a clean bed, my correctly disciplined, spirit, as it would usually be called, despite the physical state of my body, was not in. The least depressed, as it should have been according to their notions on the contrary, its power was even increased by the intense excitation that had been aroused in it just before the accident by my repeated disappointment in people, particularly in those who devote themselves to what they call science, and by the disillusion caused me by that ideal which had gradually been formed in my common presence thanks chiefly to a commandment inculcated in me in my childhood, which affirms that, the highest aim and sense of human life is the striving for the welfare of one's neighbor, and that this is attainable only through the conscious renunciation of one's own. And so, after I had attentively read over that opening chapter of the first series, written in the conditions just described, and had recalled by association the texts of the many succeeding chapters which, according to my conviction, are bound to produce in the consciousness of the reader's non-habitual impressions that always, as is said, engender substantial results, I, or rather that, something, dominant in my common presence that now represents the sum of the results issuing from the data crystallized during my life, data which, among other things, engender in a man who has set himself the aim of, mentating actively and impartially, during his responsible existence the ability to penetrate and understand the psyche of people of various types. I decided, in concluding this first series of my writings, and urged by the impulse called, love of kind, that arose in me at that moment, to limit myself to attending the first of a considerable number of my lectures that were read publicly during the existence of the establishment I had founded under the name of the Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man. Quote, that institute, by the way, no longer exists, and I find it both necessary and opportune, chiefly in order to pacify certain types in various corners of the world, to declare categorically, here and now, that I have liquidated it completely and forever. It was with an impulse of inexpressible grief and despondency that I was constrained to make the decision to liquidate this institute, and also everything organized and carefully prepared for the opening, the following year, of 18 branches in different countries, 
In short, to abandon everything I had previously created with almost superhuman labor, chiefly because, about three months after the aforementioned accident, when the functioning of my usual mentation had been more or less re-established, although my body was still quite powerless, I realized that the attempt to preserve the existence of this institute, in the absence of real people around me and the impossibility of procuring, without my help, the enormous material means required, would inevitably lead to a catastrophe that would result for me, in my old age, as well as for many others wholly dependent on me, in a condition of half-starved, vegetation. Quote, The lecture I propose to add as a conclusion to this first series was read more than once during the existence of the Institute by my pupils of the first rank, as they were then called certain of them, by the way, as it later turned out to my sincere regret, showed a predisposition in their essence to the swift transformation of their psyche into the psyche called Asnamusian, a predisposition that soon became evident and clearly discernible to all more or less normal persons around them when, at the moment of inevitable crisis, due to my accident, in everything I had thus far accomplished, they, fearing for their skins, that is, fearing to lose their personal welfare, which by the way I had created for them, deserted the common work and, with their tails between their legs, took themselves off to their kennels where, profiting by the crumbs fallen from my so to say, idea table, they opened what I would call their, Shachamashur workshop booths, and, with a secret feeling of, hope and perhaps even of joy at their speedy and complete release from my vigilant control, began manufacturing out of various unfortunate, naive people, candidates for lunatic asylums. I have chosen this particular lecture because when I first began to spread the ideas I wished to introduce into the life of people, it was specially composed here in Europe to serve as the introduction or, as it were, threshold, to the complete series of lectures, the totality of which alone can make clear in a form accessible to everybody the necessity and even the unavoidable obligation, of putting into practice the immutable truths I have elucidated and established in half a century of active work, day and night, and also to prove that it is actually possible to employ these truths for the welfare of people and furthermore I chose this lecture because, happening to be present at the large gathering where it was last read publicly, I made an addition to it which fully corresponds to the hidden thought introduced by Mr. Beelzebub himself into his so to say, concluding chord, an addition which, by illuminating once more that supreme objective truth, will in my opinion enable the reader to perceive and assimilate it as befits a being who claims to be made in the image of God. Quote, Lecture I. The diversity, according to law, of the manifestations of human individuality. Last read at the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York, January 1924. The investigations of many scientists of past ages, and also the data obtained at the present time by means of the quite exceptionally conducted research of the Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man according to the system of G. I. Third Jeff. 
have shown that the whole individuality of every man, according to higher laws and the conditions of the process of human life, established from the very beginning and gradually fixed on earth, of whatever heredity he is the result, and in whatever accidental conditions he arose and developed, must from the beginning of his responsible life, in order to respond to the sense and predestination of his existence as a man and not merely as an animal, indispensably consist of four definite and distinct personalities. The first of these four independent personalities is nothing other than the totality of the automatic functioning proper to man, as to all animals, the data for which are composed, on the one hand, of the sum total of the results of impressions perceived since birth from all the surrounding reality, as well as from everything intentionally implanted in him from outside and, on the other hand, of the result of the process, also inherent in every animal, called, daydreaming, and this totality of automatic functioning most people ignorantly call, consciousness, or, at best, thinking. Quote, The second of the four personalities, functioning in most cases entirely independently of the first, is the sum of the results of data deposited and fixed in the common presence of every man, as of every animal, through the six organs called, receivers of vibrations of different qualities, organs that function in accordance with the new impressions perceived, and whose sensitivity depends upon heredity and upon the conditions of the preparatory formation for responsible existence of the given individual. The third independent part of the whole being is the basic functioning of his organism as well as the play of the motor reflex manifestations acting upon each other within that functioning, manifestations whose quality likewise depends on heredity and the circumstances prevailing during his preparatory formation. And the fourth personality, which should also be a distinct part of the whole individual, is none other than the manifestation of the totality of the results of the already automatized functioning of the three enumerated personalities separately formed and independently educated in him. That is to say, it is that part of a being which is called, I. Close. In the common presence of a man, for the spiritualization and manifestation of each of the three separately formed parts of his entire whole there is an independent, center of gravity localization, as it is called, that is to say, a, brain, and each of these localizations, with its own complete system, has for the totality of its manifestations its own peculiarities and predispositions proper to it alone consequently, in order to make possible the all-round perfecting of a man, a corresponding, correct education is absolutely indispensable for each of these three parts, and not such a treatment as is given nowadays under the name of, education. Only then can the, I, that should be in a man be his own, I. According to the serious experiments and investigations already mentioned, which were carried on over many years, or even simply according to the sane and impartial reflection of any contemporary man, the common presence of every man, particularly of one who for some reason claims to be not just an ordinary, average man, but one of the intelligentsia, in the genuine sense of the word, 
should consist of all four of these distinct and quite definite personalities, and each of them should be developed in a corresponding way so that during his responsible existence the manifestations of these separate parts will harmonize with one another. To illustrate more clearly the diversity of origin and nature of the personalities manifested in the general organization of a man, and also to underline the difference between the I that should be in the common presence of a man without quotation marks, that is, a real man, and the pseudo I. That people today mistake for it, one can very well make use of an analogy which, though worn threadbare by spiritualists, occultists, theosophists, and other contemporary specialists in catching fish in muddy waters, with their prattle about the astral body, the mental body, and other such bodies that are supposed to exist in man, can nevertheless throw light on the question we are now considering. A man is a whole, with all of his distinct and separately functioning localizations, that is to say, his independently formed and educated personalities is almost exactly comparable to that equipage for transporting a passenger which consists of a carriage, a horse, and a coachman. It must be remarked, to begin with, that the difference between a real man and a pseudo-man, that is, between a man who has his own, I, and one who has not, is indicated in this analogy by the passenger sitting in the carriage in the first case, that of the real man, the passenger is the owner of the carriage, and in the second case, he is merely the first chance passerby who, like the fair in a hackney carriage, is continually changing. The body of a man, with all its motor reflex manifestations, corresponds simply to the carriage itself. All the functionings and manifestations of feeling of a man correspond to the horse harness to the carriage and drawing it. The coachman sitting on the box and directing the horse corresponds to what in a man people usually call consciousness or thought. And finally, the passenger sitting in the carriage and giving orders to the coachman is what is called, I. The fundamental evil among contemporary people is that, owing to the rooted and widespread abnormal methods of education of the rising generation, this fourth personality, which should be present in everybody on reaching responsible age, is entirely lacking in them, and almost all of them. Consist only of three of the enumerated parts, which, moreover, are formed arbitrarily of themselves and anyhow in other words, Almost every contemporary man of responsible age consists of neither more nor less than a hackney carriage, and what is more, a broken down carriage that has long ago seen its day, a crop of a horse, and on the box, a tattered amalion, half asleep, half drunk coachman, whose time designated by Mother Nature for self-perfection passes in fantastic daydreams while he waits on a corner for any old chance passenger the first one who happens along hires him and dismisses him just as he pleases, and not only him but also all the parts subordinate to him. Pursuing this analogy between a typical contemporary man with his thoughts, feelings, and body, and a hackney carriage with its horse and coachman, we can clearly see that in each of the parts composing these two organizations there must have been formed and must exist its own separate needs, habits, tastes, and so on. 
proper to it alone because, according to the different nature of their origin and the diverse conditions of their formation, and also the varying possibilities put into them, there must inevitably have been formed in each of these parts its own psyche, its own notions, its own subjective supports, its own viewpoints, and so on. The whole sum of the manifestations of human thought, with all the inherencies proper to its functioning and with all its specific characteristics, corresponds in almost every respect to the essence and manifestations of a typical hired coachman. Like all hired coachmen in general, he is a certain type called Cabby, he is not entirely illiterate because, owing to the laws existing in his country for the general compulsory teaching of the three R's, he was obliged in his childhood to put in an occasional appearance at what is called the parish school. Although he himself is a country boy and has remained as ignorant as his fellow rustics, yet rubbing shoulders, thanks to his profession, with people of various positions and education and picking up from them, a bit here and a bit there, a lot of expressions for various notions, he has now come to look down with contempt upon everything smacking of the country, indignantly dismissing it all as ignorance. In short, this is a type to whom one could apply perfectly the adage, too good for the crows, but the peacocks won't have him. He considers himself competent even in questions of religion, politics, and sociology, with his equals he likes to argue, those whom he regards as his inferiors he likes to teach, with his superiors he is a servile flatterer, he stands before them, as is said, cap in hand. One of his greatest weaknesses is dangling after the neighborhood cooks and housemaids, but best of all he likes to put away a good square meal and to gulp down another glass or two, and then, fully satiated, drowsily to daydream. To gratify these weaknesses of his he regularly steals part of the money his employer gives him to buy fodder for the horse. Like every cabbie, he works only under the lash, and if occasionally he does a job without being made to, it is always in the hope of a tip. The desire for tips has gradually taught him to detect certain weaknesses in the people he deals with and to take advantage of them, he has automatically learned to be cunning, to flatter, to stroke people the right way, as they say, and in general, to lie. On every convenient occasion when he has a free moment, he slips into a saloon or a bar where, over a glass of beer, he daydreams for hours at a time, or talks with a type like himself, or just reads the paper. He tries to look imposing, wears a beard, and if he is thin, pads himself out to appear more important. As regards the feeling localization in a man, the totality of its manifestations and the whole system of its functioning correspond perfectly to the horse of the hackney carriage, in our analogy. Incidentally, this comparison of the horse with the composition of human feeling will help to show particularly clearly the error and one-sidedness of the contemporary education inflicted on the rising generation. The horse, owing to the negligence of those around it during its early years, and to its constant solitude, is as if locked up within itself, in other words, its 
inner life, is driven inside and for external manifestations it has nothing but inertia. Thanks to the abnormal conditions around it, the horse has never received any special education but has been molded solely under the influence of constant crashings and vile abuse.